Well, uh, good afternoon, everybody, and uh, welcome. Uh, my name is uh, Dietrich Stout. I'm the uh, director of the uh, TMBT, and this is a TMBT talk. We're very pleased to, to bring to you. I think probably most of you are already familiar with the Center for Mind, Brain, and Culture. Uh, if you're not, or if you just haven't uh, gotten around to it yet, I encourage you to uh, join our mailing list, visit our website, TMBC, uh, Emory, EU. Uh, sign up uh, to be an affiliate or to join our mailing list. Now you can find out about all of our events uh, like this one that we have uh, during the course of the year, which include both uh, lectures uh, and smaller discussion lunches, other kinds of events. We've just started uh, uh, what we call the Mind Meat Mixers or something like that. We're having another one coming up soon. Uh, so please uh, sign up to so hear about our events uh, like this one. Also, if you are a graduate student, or you have graduate students, or you know graduate students, or like graduate students, we have a uh, certificate program that I would encourage you to check out um, in which you uh, take a, a core course with us and then some other uh, electives around the, uh, the university and you eventually get a uh, certificate. We have some uh, resources to support our certificate students, including a little bit of money for travel and so forth. And it's generally a good educational experience. So if you'd like to learn more about that, please also visit our, our website. Um, but anyway, so that's enough about the, uh, the center. We're very pleased to have uh, Tom Griffiths with us today. Uh, Tom is the Henry R. Luce Professor of Information Technology, Consciousness, and Culture at Princeton University. So you can see even his title aligns very well with the kind of things that we're trying to promote uh, at the CNBC. Uh, I can say that he's a high profile researcher in decision making and reinforcement learning, cultural evolution, and statistical language models, and like a million other things. Uh, so if you visit his lab website, website, you'll find he has too many publications to count over the past 20 years. I didn't count them, uh, but Google thinks that um, the number with more than 10 citations is like 321, if that gives you uh, some idea of the scope. Uh, but thankfully, if you do visit uh, his website, you'll find he's color coded his publications into 12 different topical categories. Uh, so you can actually navigate this immense output. Um, so we're really thrilled to have a speaker who so clearly embodies the aspirations of our center join us today. Uh, so Tom got his PhD from Stanford, and he's had faculty positions at Brown and Berkeley, now at Princeton. Uh, he received the Trollin Research Award from the National Academy of Sciences in 2019. Uh, became a fellow of the Guggenheim Memorial Foundation in 2017. Uh, and he has, again, a whole bunch of like 10 or more outstanding early career awards from places like NSF, American Psychology, Psychological Association, the Sloan Foundation, and this going all the way back to uh, AI 10 to Watch Award from IEE Intelligent Systems Magazine in 2006. He has a book called Algorithms to Live By uh, on the computer science of human decisions. And he has even published what he himself describes as a manifesto uh, on big data and the need for a computational cognitive revolution. On his lab page, he sums up his interest as being in developing mathematical models of higher level cognition and understanding the formal principles that underlie our ability to solve the computational problems we face in everyday life. Uh, so I believe that's what we'll be hearing some more about today. Uh, join me in welcoming Tom. Hey, thank you for that very nice introduction. Uh, it's wonderful to be here. As you heard, uh, I'm somebody who uh, really likes interdisciplinary research and I've been enjoying talking to people from all sorts of disciplines today. Um, I'm talking to you in the room and also people on Zoom. So I'm gonna try and manage my, I'm gonna stay in this location and not get too far away from my computer so people can hear uh, and we'll see how that goes. Okay, so what you're gonna hear about today is uh, one small slice through all of those kinds of things that you were hearing about, which is really looking at the question of how it is that we should be using our minds um, and trying to answer a question about like in general, what is it that we, we should be doing when we're trying to do things like make decisions. I'm just gonna close that, okay. All right, um, so uh, I should say this is joint work with uh, Falk Leder, who's at the Max Planck Institute on his way to UCLA, um, was a graduate student with me at Berkeley, and, and Fred Calloway, uh, who's a graduate student at Princeton, uh, just started a, um, a postdoc at NYU, um, and you'll see various other people throughout the talk. Okay, so one of the challenges of being an interdisciplinary researcher is that the people who you encounter are gonna have different perspectives on the subject that you're interested in, depending on what field they're coming from. 
And so as somebody who's interested in, you know, humans and how human minds work, uh, my challenge is that, you know, when I go from the psychology department to the computer science department, I end up uh, meeting people who have very different views of uh, how well human minds work. So in the psychology department, you discover that humans are embarrassing, right? That we're not very good at making decisions, that we go around doing things that we shouldn't do. You find books that have titles like Predictably Irrational, Inevitable Illusions, How Mistakes of Reason Rule Our Minds, The Fallibility of Human Reason in Everyday Life, or Kluge, The Haphazard Construction of the, the Human Mind. Um, and these books are really, you know, summarizing a perspective, which is that, you know, when we try and make decisions, making decisions is difficult. As a consequence, we use various shortcuts, heuristics. Those heuristics result in us making errors. There's sort of systematic biases that are associated with them. And as a consequence, you know, we're not doing necessarily a great job of, of trying to do the things that we try and do in the world. Uh, when I walk across campus to the computer science department, I get a very different perspective on humans, right? Uh, in the computer science department, humans are inspiring, right? If we want to build AI systems that are going to be able to solve problems intelligently, the best example we have for many kinds of problems of what it is we're trying to do is make something which is like a human, or, you know, maybe we can even beat a human at doing the kinds of things that humans can do. Uh, this is a classic example. There's lots of other examples in the news today, but this is a classic example. Um, uh, this is the game between uh, Gary Kasparov and Deep Blue back in the 1990s. Deep Blue ended up winning this game. Um, but you know, here Kasparov's ability to, to solve this puzzle of you know, playing a, a good chess game was part of what had motivated AI researchers to try and build a system that had similar kinds of capacities. Now, uh, even though this is an example where the computer ends up beating the human, I think you can still look at this and find it inspiring, right? So there's a sense in which this is an uneven contest. So uh, if we compare these two systems, uh, the system that's on the, uh, the left here, Kasparov is sort of evaluating on the order of something like one chess position per second, whereas the system on the right, Deep Blue, is able to consider about 100,000 chess positions per second. Uh, the system on the right is powered by an industrial power plant. The system on the left is powered by some black coffee and a piece of toast, right? So. Even if you're not inspired necessarily by the kinds of things that humans can do, you can be inspired by the way in which they do them, which is that humans are the best examples we have of systems that are able to efficiently solve a vast array of different kinds of problems, right? And one of the things that it seems like we're really good at is using our cognitive resources in effective ways. So this sets up an interesting paradox, right? Uh, as somebody who talks to both psychologists and computer scientists, I'd like to be able to resolve that paradox. Um, and the paradox is, you know, basically this question of like, are we smart or are we dumb? Are we doing a good job of solving problems? Or are we doing a bad job of solving problems? Are we inspiring? Are we embarrassing? And I think we can resolve that paradox by uh, sort of accepting two premises. First of all, humans have limited cognitive resources. And that's part of what leads us to making errors when we're making decisions. This isn't a controversial claim. It's an idea that goes all the way back to the 1950s. People like Herbert Simon talking about bounded rationality as an idea about, you know, why it is that something like our sort of classical notions of rationality might be a poor characterization of what it is that people actually do. But the, the second premise, and the one that I'm gonna talk about in more detail today, is the idea that maybe, you know, the other thing that's going on is that we actually do a pretty good job of using those limited resources that we have. Um, and so this is something that lets us solve many different kinds of problems efficiently, right? So part of what makes us smart and inspiring is that even though we have those limited resources, we're able to make effective use of them in a way that then allows us to solve lots of different problems and allows us to do pretty well despite the constraints that we operate under. So in order to make that argument, we now have to be clear about what it means to do a good job of using your cognitive resources. And that's basically what this whole talk is gonna be about. It's gonna be about you know, thinking about how to define rationality in a way that takes into account the fact that we're not able to, you know, sort of engage in infinite amounts of computation to try and solve the problems that we're trying to solve. So the classical notion of rationality, the one that we're normally compared to when we're held up as being embarrassing, uh, is the sort of notion of rationality that we're, we're sort of used to seeing in something like economics, uh, something like taking the action that has highest expected utility, where expected utility is evaluated by, you know, uh, basically, you know, uh, considering the possible outcomes that could be associated with an action for each of those outcomes, having some utility associated with it, and then taking the expectation over those possible outcomes, just averaging together those outcomes with the probabilities that they occur. Uh, and so here, let's see if I can use this pointer. Yeah, so here the, the emphasis is put on the action that we're going to take. So if you reduce this to a slogan, the slogan is something like do the right thing, right? Do the thing that 
um, is the, 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 the thing that maximizes expected utility. And so from a cognitive scientist perspective, there are a few things that are unsatisfying about this definition. Uh, one of them is that it says nothing about what you have to do in order to actually make this choice, right? There's nothing about what's going on inside your head, right? Nothing about the sort of cognitive processes you might be engaging in. Um, if we want to use a nasty word, we could say this is a behaviorist theory of rational action, right? It's, a, it's saying, let's, let's characterize rational action just in terms of the environments that we live in, and then the actions that we're going to take in those environments, just these sort of external things. There's nothing about the internal processes. And the other thing that's unsatisfying about it is that it's not really achievable, right? So there's no way that an agent that has any kind of finite computational resources can actually achieve that kind of criterion of rationality because it requires us to make this choice without actually knowing anything about how hard it might be for us to evaluate expected utilities or sort of consider possible outcomes in a particular scenario. And so AI researchers in the 1980s who were interested in building AI systems that could do meaningful things were unsatisfied with this definition for the same reason. They wanted to say, well, what is it that an AI system actually should do? And that led to an alternative, sorry about that, definition of rationality uh, in terms of uh, something that uh, I'm going to refer to as resource rationality. It's gone by a few different names in the, um, the, the AI literature. So bounded optimality, computational rationality, various kinds of uh, sort of characterizations of this. But the basic idea is that when we're thinking about what constitutes rational action, uh, we're going to think about rational action as being not about the actions that we take in the external world, but the actions that we perform inside our head. And so we're gonna characterize the rational agent as an agent that's using a strategy or an algorithm or um, you know, a, 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 a policy which is doing a good job of trading off utility and computational cost and trying to select what these actions are. And so now if we look at this here, we have our, our sort of equation that characterizes this. It's a bit more complicated than this one over here, but the basic idea is that now the thing that we're going to sort of focus on is this policy or algorithm or strategy. And we're saying, choose the best strategy uh, where a strategy gives you a sequence of computations you're going to execute that are going to result in beliefs that you have, such that if you end up taking the action that maximizes expected utility based on your current beliefs, you end up doing a, a reasonably good job of solving the problem you're trying to solve. And so implicit in this equation is this trade-off between the expected utility that you end up with and how hard you have to think in order to get there in the first place, right? This trade-off between the computational cost of selecting an action and then the benefit of the action that you end up receiving. And so here now the emphasis is put on you know, taken off the thing that you do and put onto the thinking that you do in order to get you to the point where you're ready to, to make a decision. And so if I reduce this even further to a sort of cartoon picture, it's something like this, right? On the left, we have expected utility theory. The emphasis is entirely on the action that we take. On the right, we have resource rationality, where now we're going to think about the internal computations that we're going to execute in order to select that action in the world. And now the problem that we have to sort of solve is, is one is saying, Okay, now what are sort of good things for me to think about in order for me to be ready to, to make a reasonable decision? Okay, so I'm gonna use this framework throughout this talk to uh, try and engage with now some of these kinds of questions about do people do a good job of using their cognitive resources? And the first thing that we can do is we can go back to that classic sort of uh, characterization of human cognition in terms of maybe being embarrassing and sort of, you know, these error-prone heuristics that we follow. Um, and we can actually say, in fact, this gives us a way of thinking about the question of what makes something a good heuristic in the first place, right? So this idea that what we should be doing is, you know, because decision-making is hard, following heuristics, those heuristics have consequences in terms of the biases that they produce. We can actually say, well, if you wanted to say what makes something a good heuristic, a good heuristic is something which basically trades off these two things, error and computational cost, right? A heuristic is a simple strategy that we can use for solving a problem. And that trade-off between error and computational cost is exactly what makes something a, a good heuristic. So we can then ask the question, are the kinds of heuristics that people follow good heuristics based on this sort of criterion? Um, and in a few papers, we and others have shown that some of the classic things that people do that seem quite strange are things that we can make sense of with respect to this kind of definition of rational action, right? Where the idea is that doing things like um, probability matching, where you're choosing options with probability proportional to the probability they provide a reward, 
or uh, anchoring an adjustment where you're uh, starting with a number and then adjusting away from that number, uh, but an inadequate amount to get to the sort of estimate that you should be producing in a particular problem, or focusing on extreme events when you're trying to think about making a decision. Um, these are all things that make a certain amount of sense when we start to characterize what the computational problems are that people have to solve and what the computational cost might be in, in solving them. And I'm not going to talk more about that now. Um, if you're curious about that, I have more slides on it and I can sort of talk about that in the questions. What I'm going to focus on in this talk is how we can go beyond these cases where we kind of knew what the answer was already, right? We sort of knew that these are weird things that people did. And then we went back and said, maybe we can explain those in terms of this kind of framework um, and try and engage with a different question, which is, can we use this kind of approach to make predictions about the kinds of strategies that people will engage in when they encounter a, a, a particular task, right? So rather than starting from, here's a weird thing that people do, can we explain it? We're going to instead say, okay, here's a problem people have to solve. Can we make a prediction about the kinds of strategies that they should use in the context of solving that problem? Um, and the way that uh, I'm going to do this is really directed at giving us a generalizable theory that's at that gets at this interaction between the sort of how well we're solving our problems and what computational costs are involved in them in a way that then allows us to make predictions about the kinds of strategies people will engage in across many different kinds of problems right so one of the challenges for that classic heuristics and biases view of the mind is that at the end of the day we end up with a big list of 200 heuristics and now we're going to try and understand what people do in a new setting and so there's a question, which of these heuristics should they be using? They could be using this one, they could be using that one, they could be using this one. And we're going to try and get around that by saying, okay, let's use this mathematical theory and from this derive automatically what kind of strategy people should be using in this circumstance. And then you can use that as a lens for understanding what it is that they actually do. And so the key to doing this is sort of going back to this framework that I was talking about and recognizing that it sets up this problem of choosing a cognitive strategy to follow in terms of a, a, another kind of decision problem. So the decision problem that we now have, if we're trying to choose what strategy we're going to use, we can think about what a strategy corresponds to as some sequence of computations we're going to execute in order to allow us to solve a problem. And then we can think about that problem in terms of basically making a sequence of choices about what computations we're going to perform. So we can say, okay, I'm gonna make a decision. Now, what should I think about first? Okay, now I know what the result of that is. What should I think about next? Now I know what the result of that is, and so on and so on. And so we reduce this problem of trying to figure out a strategy to solve a problem to one of trying to choose a, a sequence of computations that we're going to execute. Um, and we can use some of the uh, math that's been used for formalizing these kinds of sequential decision problems to turn this into a problem that we know how to solve. And so I'm going to explain what all this means over the next few slides. But the basic idea is that we can formulate this as what's called a meta-level Markov decision process, and we can solve it using methods that come from the, the literature on reinforcement learning. Um, and so these are methods that are you know, used in computer science, but have also informed a lot of work on the sort of cognitive neuroscience of reinforcement learning. Um, and so this gives us a nice connection to an existing psychological neuroscientific literature, uh, as well as a set of tools for solving these problems abstractly. Okay. So what does this mean? What's a meta-level Markov decision process? So I'm going to start with the idea of a Markov decision process. And so this is the standard formalism that's used in uh, computer science and statistics and so on for characterizing how it is that we should actually solve a decision problem where we're going to make a sequence of decisions and the outcomes of our previous actions are going to influence what the, the current decision is that we're going to face. And so the way that this works we assume that the world is in some state. We're going, going to then uh, take an action. Based on the action that we perform, the world transitions to a new state, and then we receive some reward. And then uh, from that new state, we have the same problem. We're going to decide what action we're going to take. The world is going to transition to a new state, and we're going to receive some reward. Okay, so that's kind of abstract, but you can think about this as characterizing all sorts of different kinds of problems. For example, if you have like a, a navigation problem, I'm trying to get from here to the, the door over there, right? I know what my goal is, my reward I will receive when I get to the door. There's some cost for taking each step. Uh, and so the current state would be where I'm standing in the room. The actions I could take are walking in all sorts of different directions. And then the, the next state will be where I'm gonna end up as a consequence of taking that step, right? And so this gives us a way of breaking down 
what would otherwise be a complex problem, getting all the way over to the other side of the room into a sequence of simpler problems where we're just making individual decisions about the next action we're going to perform. So what it means to then solve this is to derive what's called a policy. And a policy characterizes based on the state that you're in, the action that you should perform next, right? And that's all that it means. So when we talk about solving a Markov decision process, it just means whatever state we're in, we know what action we should perform next. So then I could have a policy for navigating to the door, that policy would describe, you know, for every position that I could be in the room, what direction I should move from that position. That's that's a policy for solving that particular Markov decision process. Okay, we've got pretty abstract. I just want to check everyone's okay. Yep, everyone's good. Yeah. It's it's because the the action that you're using um, is presumed just to depend on the state that you're in, right? So like it says. If if I had a robot that was following this policy, all it would care about is where is it in the room, right? And uh, then it's going to take its next action depending just on its location. It doesn't need to know what happened before that. Okay. And it's called Markov because there's the, the dependency between states is just, just based on the previous state. Okay. okay, everyone's good? Okay, all right. So now a meta level Markov decision process uses the same logic, but rather than applying it to the actions we take in the external world, we're gonna apply it to actions that occur inside our heads. Okay, and so now instead of states, we have beliefs. Instead of actions, we have computations. And instead of these costs being costs that we're sort of physically incurring, these are costs that we're incurring cognitively, right? And so now the idea is we have some belief state, we're going to execute a computation, that computation is going to change our beliefs. So you could think about this as doing something like getting a, a sample from the world or getting some information we're going to use to update our beliefs. Uh, we use something like Bayesian inference to update our beliefs. So now we have new beliefs. There's some cost that was associated with having expended that, that unit of computation. And then uh, you know we now, in this new belief state, we're going to choose what computation to execute next and so on and so on. And at some point, we decide we're going to use this special action, which says, I am done thinking. Right, and I'm going to take an action in the world, and when we do that, we take an action based on our current beliefs, and we receive some reward. Right, and so now to solve this meta-level Markov decision process means figuring out what computation you should execute, what it is that you should think about, based on the beliefs that you currently have. Okay, and so uh, I think hopefully you can see how this solves an interesting problem for us as cognitive scientists and that it actually gives us a way of saying what you should be thinking about at any particular moment, right? Um, and that gives us a whole new tool for revisiting a whole lot of questions that we have about you know, cognitive psychology where we can ask, you know, is the way that you're searching for things in memory the way that you should be searching for things in memory? Is the way that you're paying attention to things the way you should be paying attention to things? It gives us a set of tools that we can use for sort of comparing our internal cognitive states to some kind of you know, criterion of rational action. And so what I'm now gonna do is just show you a few examples of using this framework to analyze various different kinds of things that people do. Um, and so the first of these is in the setting of multi-alternative risky choice. This is joint work with Paul Kruger, Fred Calloway, Cheyenne Gould, and, and Paul Kruger. And we chose this because it's a paradigm that's been used over many decades to study the kinds of strategies that people use when they're making a decision. The basic idea is that you're going to make a choice between different gambles. Um, for these different gambles, uh, the way that they differ is the different outcomes are associated with different payoffs. So you have a list of the different outcomes. Here you can imagine that there are some balls with letters on them that are sitting in an urn. The balls, there's different numbers of balls of different kinds in the urn. And so you kind of know the probabilities that are going to be associated with different outcomes. What you don't know is the payoffs that are associated with those. And the way you get payoff information is by clicking on one of these cells, and then that reveals that information. And so the reason why we use this paradigm, which is called the mouse lab paradigm, is that it's a good sort of first pass for testing out this theory because it forces us to externalize the computations that we're doing. The idea here is that by looking at what people click on, we kind of know what payoffs they're thinking about, and that gives us clues about the kinds of strategies that they're using. And so classic work in this paradigm has shown, for example, that one strategy people use is something called the take the best strategy, where they focus just on the row that corresponds to the highest probability outcome. They click across there, and then they choose the item that has the highest payoff from that row, right? And you can contrast this with the classical expected utility, right? Which would allow, require you to consider all of the possible payoffs and then you know, add them up and calculate the expected utility that's associated with each of these gambles. So we can, put this into the kind of framework that I was talking about. 
uh, when our, our beliefs are about what the things are that are behind those little gray boxes, right? And we can sort of have a probability distribution that characterizes the beliefs behind those boxes. The actions we take are evaluating one of the options, right? By clicking on one of those boxes and getting some information. There's some cost associated with that. Uh, and then at the end of the day, we're ready to act. What we're going to do is choose one of these gambles and we get a payoff, which is generated by actually sort of running that, that lottery. Um, and so what we did was, was actually just cover the sort of entire space of these different tasks by looking at manipulating things like how much money you get, like, you know, what the distribution is of payoffs that are associated with um, those different uh, cells in our matrix. Um, by manipulating the, um, the amount of skew and the probability distribution from something which is very skewed to something which is very uniform, and by manipulating the explicit cost which is associated with clicking on those cells, how costly it is to evaluate one of these options. Uh, and that defines 50 different conditions, and each of those conditions we generated 20 scenarios, and then we solved that meta-level markup decision process to work out what the optimal cognitive strategy looks like. And so the way, oh yeah. 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 So you, you started off talking about how the cognitive strategy you contrasted it with the irrationality. Yeah. Where's the rush? Like, I'll show you some irrationality okay. in a moment. <laughs> I mean, so the irrationality here would be uh, that you're not using, you know, you could say abstractly, you're not using all the information you should, but this is a case where it actually seems like you shouldn't use all the information all the time, okay. right? And we can actually characterize what that means. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And you're going to get to it. Yeah. Okay. And the, the cost you're modeling for is just an explicit manipulated cost. To yeah. The, you know, that's right. Computational cost. Yeah. That and that's going to come up um, later on. Yeah. Okay. All right. So the way that I'm going to show you these results is by basically taking this matrix, right? Uh, so that here now you can see some of these have been clicked on and revealed. Uh, and I'm just going to reorganize this matrix into a canonical form where the rows are sorted by probability. So this is the highest probability row, second highest, third highest, and so on. And then the, um, the columns are sorted by the number of clicks. Okay. And that just gives us a canonical representation. And then we're going to cluster together the solutions that, that the model generates. And so this is what those solutions look like, right? So here, blue is low click probability, yellow is high click probability. And these are the cluster centroids from, from doing k-means clustering. Um, and what this reveals is that there's a few different strategies that make sense across the different sort of settings of these parameters. Uh, two of these are the classic strategies that I talked about, right? This is the take the best strategy. You just focus on the highest probability row. And then this is the expected utility weighted additive strategy where you basically click on all the cells and then you use all the information to make a decision. But then there's also a couple of new strategies that previously hadn't been identified. Um, this is called, uh, uh, we call it a satisficing strategy, right? Where basically what you're doing is focusing on the highest probability row, but you sort of only make a few clicks. And then once you observe something which is above some threshold, you've got enough information and you, and you choose that option. And then this is a sort of hybrid of take the best and satisfying, where you do look at the first, the highest probability outcome, uh, but you also do a little bit of sampling outside that. Um, and so these are all things that the model's doing, right? These are all optimal strategies. And so the next question to ask is, what is it that people do? And so we ran a crazy giant experiment where we took all of those different conditions that I talked about, and we ran people through them. We took like more than 2,000 participants performing this task. Uh, and we got samples from people in all of those different settings, and then we could look at the strategies that people use. Um, and so we can do the same kind of analysis, and it looks like this, right? So now we're doing the same cluster analysis on the strategies that people use. And what we see is that basically you get back the same four strategies that the model uses, plus this fifth one. Uh, and this is one where people don't click on anything uh, and then just choose a gamble, right? And so, um, uh, so, so this, it seems like people at least are, are using the, the kinds of strategies that they should be using when they're solving this problem. We can also ask whether they're using those strategies. How did you get the um, We looked at, we did the k-means clustering for different numbers, and then we looked at what, you know, what, what seems like it's actually capturing the okay. structure in there. Yeah. Um, and what's your fit? Does it look like human? Uh, oh, the fifth one? It's basically, you get, you get sort of like, these get split up more finely. Yeah. Um, the, you see a correspondence regardless of what you choose. I'm just sort of showing you the cleanest version of that. Yeah. Um, uh, we can ask whether they're using those strategies in the right circumstances. Um, and the answer is that they're sensitive to the right things, although they're not as sensitive as the model is. Okay, And so this is just showing as we vary those, those dimensions, this is the, the magnitude of the stakes. This is whether going from a, a very skewed distribution to a very uniform distribution. And this is going as we're sort of increasing the cost. 
Um, this one is probably the easiest one to understand, right? So for the model, if cost is zero, then what you should be doing is that weighted additive strategy. That's the one where you click on everything, right? And then you just make a decision based on that. And that's sort of 100% of the time. People do that more, right? But they only do it about, you know, 25% of the time, right? Um, uh, and then uh, as the cost increases, some of those more frugal strategies are the ones you should follow. Uh, this is our satisficing strategy in orange here. That's the one where you click the least, right? You just click a few times across the highest probability row. Uh, and you can see that that increases a lot in the model and it increases a fair amount in people. Okay. Yeah. How do you make cost zero for the human? Yeah, so it's a good question. So we we can't, right? Um, uh, and so what you one reason why you can see this discrepancy, and I, I can talk more about this, but we did a very detailed analysis of you know what it is that's going on in, in the errors that people are making. Um, let me I'll skip ahead and just sort of show you a numerical version of this, and then um, I don't have the relevant plot, but uh, so basically, if we actually look at what their performance is, um, people are are sort of they're getting about like 70% ish of the, the payoff that they could be getting if they were following the optimal strategy. So what it looks like is people have access to a repertoire of strategies. That's the right set of strategies, but they're, um, uh, but then there's a few reasons why they're differing from the model. One of those is that the actual cost for people is not just the cost that we're imposing in the task, but they have some intrinsic computational cost, right? And you can actually estimate that by going back to the, model and you can ask okay well what what does the cost have to be in order for you to only do this about you know 25 percent of the time in this circumstance and you can sort of imagine setting a parameter that does that and so we can do that and you get a better fit from the model i'm just showing you a version of the model where you have no parameters involved right um the uh but when we've also run a version of the experiment where um you force people to look at every gamble for 30 seconds right so they still have a click cost but we're making it so that they're sitting there and they're going to be there for that long, regardless of what choices they make. And so there's a sense in which that's removing the computational cost and then that difference disappears. Right? Um, uh, but the thing that seems to really be driving the errors that people are making here is just being sort of insufficiently adaptive in the strategies that they're using, right? So they are not changing their strategy as much as the model is in this setting. Yeah. So is this kind of the allocation within a subject, or do you find that subjects prefer a strategy over others just um, based on the differences? Um, so uh, in this case, we don't have the data to be able to answer that, right? But that's the kind of question that you could ask next, right? Having having said that. Yeah. Okay. Other questions? Okay. All right. So. Um, so this is, you know, as I said, this is a sort of first pass. Now I sort of, hopefully you kind of get an idea of what the, the approach looks like. What I'm now gonna do is try and uh, address a couple of concerns you might have, right? One of them is that we had this explicit click cost and we're forcing people to externalize the, 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 the computations here, right? That's a little bit artificial. Um, and the other thing is that I sort of promised you that this was gonna be an approach that's gonna generalize across different scenarios and give us sort of meaningful predictions across them. So now I'm gonna to jump to a very different kind of choice problem. Um, uh, which is simple choice, where now people are just choosing between different snack foods, right? Um, and so this is joint work with Fred Calloway and Antonio Rangel. Uh, and what Antonio does is he studies simple choice, but he studies how people allocate their gaze when they're making these kinds of decisions. So now the idea is that as you're deciding which of these things that you want, you're probably looking back and forth, you're considering your options, you're thinking about your know, previous experiences you've had with these things. You're, you know, in some sense, sort of sampling from your estimate of your utility function in order to uh, make a decision. Um, and the way in which uh, people's gaze moves and how it affects their decisions is something that's been studied extensively in the context of these kinds of tasks. So we can formalize this by taking this problem and just thinking about it in the same kinds of terms I was thinking, talking about before, where the idea is that you've got some uncertainty about the utility that you might associate with each of these items, just as you have uncertainty about what the utilities were behind those cells in the mouse lab task. When you think about a thing, that's kind of like clicking on it and getting some information about that, uh, that, that, that payoff. But in this case, we're going to assume it's uncertain information, right? So you don't get the exact number. You just get a sample from some internal distribution that you use to then update your estimate of what the utility is that's associated with that item. And we can take this and we can put it in the same kind of meta-level markup decision process framework. And so now we get this picture where, you know, our beliefs are about the utilities associated with these items. We're doing the same kind of thing of evaluating these options and making a choice between them. 
uh, and at some point we're we're ready to to take an action. Right? And so our evaluations here are associated with not clicks on a on a on a screen, but rather where it is that we're looking when we're trying to make these decisions. Um, so this is essentially the same kind of model. There's one extra tweak, which is that what we're doing is we're discretizing time. So we're making an assumption that you know you're sort of generating one sample every you know some number of milliseconds. Uh, and so uh, what we then do is we say you can keep looking at the same thing, or there's uh, uh, an increase in cost when you look at something else, right? So there's a, a small switch cost that we have to add into the model. But that otherwise it's the same kind of model as the one I was talking about before. And then we can use this to look at data that comes from this kind of task where you give people these snack foods. They, first of all, uh, give you a, a rating for all of the snack foods of how much they like those. I'm sorry, people are getting hungry now. Um, uh, so you can say how much you like all of those snack foods, uh, and then you put them in the choice scenario, and then they're given a choice between three foods. And then you look at what it is that they're looking at, and then what it is that um, uh, they end up choosing. And so from this, a classic result is that how long you spend looking at something and the probability that you choose it uh, are related, right? And that's what this plot is showing. This is fixation time for how, how long you look at a particular item, probability that you choose that item. The black line is the human data. The red line is the model. This is something that falls directly out of that model that I was talking about. And the reason why this comes out of the model is if you've got some options in front of you, if you sort of first look at everything and sort of get a little bit of information about it, then what you should do is really focus in on the things that you think are the things you're more likely to choose, right? So if you've sort of say, seen this thing, you know, I think that's not that great. These two look pretty good. Now I'm making a decision between these two things, right? And so I'm going to focus my fixations on those things. And, you know, that's the sort of rational thing to do in terms of gathering information you're going to use to make the choice. And so that means that you're going to be focused more on the, the, um, uh, the things that you're, you're ultimately more likely to choose. And in particular, you're going to be more focused on high value items, right? Because the information that you're getting by sampling is sort of critical and giving you some information about the value of those things. And again, this falls directly out of the model. Uh, and that focus on those items is going to increase as time goes on, right? So the, the longer you spend an experiment, the more certain you are that you've ruled out uh, some of these options, the more focused you're going to be on those which are actually relevant to your choice. Uh, and again, this is something that falls out of our model. Okay. So... Uh, those first two examples were sort of in a very simple, flat, sort of choice-like setting. But what I used as my motivating example was something like this, where now this is engaging in a much more complex kind of decision, one that involves us thinking about the future and sort of planning out you know, what it is that we're going to do. Uh, and so we use the same kind of paradigm to investigate what goes on in the context of these kinds of planning problems. Um, and so this is joint work with Fred and then with Bas van Opisten, uh, Shai Engel, Priyam Das, Paul Kruger, and Clark Leader. Um, what we did was basically take the same kind of mouse lab approach, but now apply it in the context of this sort of planning problem. And so here, your job is to help this little spider to navigate through this web. Uh, and the spider is trying to find the best path, which is the path that has the highest payoff, where the payoff is the sum of all of the values that it visits along that path. And the catch is that you have to do this without knowing what those values are, right? So we turn this into a sort of mouse lab-like task where now you're gonna click on uh, a node in order to gather information about what the payoff is that's associated with it. And again, this is the strategy of externalizing our you know, sort of evaluation of these states in order to give us a way of measuring what it is that people actually do. And so we can translate this again into this same kind of framework where now your beliefs are about the values that might be behind those different cells. Uh, your actions are evaluating each of those, those, those nodes in the graph. There's a cost associated with it and so on. And at some point you take an action and you choose uh, a path through the graph. And what we're able to do is to compare the choices that people make about which nodes to evaluate to the predictions that are made by different kinds of planning algorithms, right? So a planning algorithm in computer science, the kinds of things that you would use for solving this problem and figuring out what chess move to make, those algorithms are based on basically sort of like trying to make intelligent decisions about which nodes to explore in a graph that looks like this, right? Which possibilities to consider, which paths to go down when you're trying to find out what a good path is. And what we find is that that optimal cognitive strategy that we derive from our model actually does a much better job of characterizing human choices than the kinds of algorithms that are used in computer science standardly for so solving these kinds of planning problems. Um, this is not a you know, very interpretable uh, way of visualizing these results. So I'm gonna show you an intuitive visualization, but the key idea here is that this number, which should be small, is smaller for the optimal strategy than for these other things. 
And the reason why these other algorithms don't work well and the optimal strategy does is that human planning decisions demonstrate a kind of adaptivity that's not natural to those algorithms. Um, and so here's a way of visualizing this. This is the number of clicks that have been made so far, and this is the best expected path value discovered so far. And then what the cells show is the probability that you stop searching at that point, right? So um, dark blue means low probability of stopping, and then yellow means high probability of stopping. And you should be able to see that as you go from the bottom left corner to the top right corner, you go from blue to yellow. And what that demonstrates is that people are trading off these two things. If they found a pretty good path already, and they've made a lot of clicks already, then they're quite likely to uh, decide that they're done searching, right? They're sort of adaptively choosing how much they want to explore based on these two things, how much they've explored already and, and how good the things they've found are. And that kind of adaptivity is shown not just in the human data, but also in our optimal model. And it's not demonstrated by the sorts of generic planning algorithms that are used uh, in, you know, in, in computer science for solving these kinds of problems. And so this is kind of a, a nice quantitative illustration of one of these properties that makes people good at planning, which is that we're able to make sort of good decisions about this trade-off between how much we're exploring and, and sort of how good the thing is that we found so far. Now, I promised you chess and I gave you spiders navigating uh, small uh, mazes, right? Um, and uh, I've used this, this sort of example to motivate the work we're doing for a long time. Um, but I never thought that we'd actually be able to analyze something as complex as the game of chess. Um, so chess is notorious for having a vast state space, right? Every time you make a move, you're making a decision about all sorts of pieces that you could be moving. So, you know, there's um, uh, 20 different first moves and another 20 different moves that come after that and so on and so on and so on. And so every time you have this sort of like branching factor, that means that you very quickly get up to very, very large numbers of states. And it's very hard to think about how you could possibly analyze something like that. But there are two things that have actually made it possible for us to make progress on this problem. One of them is uh, the release of massive amounts of human chess game playing data. So um, the popularity of online chess servers uh, has risen significantly in the last few years. And one of those chess servers actually releases every single game which has been played on that server. Uh, as a consequence, I think they've released about 4 billion games at this point. That's about 200 billion human decisions, right? Um, it's probably one of the largest data sets on human decision-making in existence. And so that gives us enough data that we can start to converge on some of these questions. The other is that uh, chess engines, right? The AI systems that play chess have got really, really good. Um, and as a consequence of that, we can kind of treat them as giving us the ground truth, right? For what it is that people should be doing in a particular situation. And so we can use those two things to mean that we can both use the AI system to effectively reduce the dimensionality of the problem and then use the human data to allow us to make progress on, on making sense of what it is that people actually do in those circumstances. And so this is a, a recent project that we just kicked off um, with Evan Russick, Dana Costa Kane, Baswin Offiston, and, and Marcelo Makar, where we've been looking at whether people actually do a good job of using their cognitive resources when they're playing a game of chess. And the way that we do that is by comparing two versions of an AI chess engine. Right, so uh, the way that AI chess engines work nowadays, ever since like Alpha Zero, uh, for people who are sort of in that space, the way that Alpha Zero works is basically it's trained a big neural network, which gives you an evaluation of how good a board position is. And then um, it's also got a, a system that does planning on top of that, right? So you can say for a given board position, you can kind of like have a, a immediate instinctive reaction that says, how good is this board position? But then you can also do planning on top of that and work out what the consequences of playing forward from that position are going to be. And so we can take those two versions of the chess engine, one that is just making an evaluation based on the giant neural network, and one that's making an evaluation by adding in these extra steps of planning. And we can say, let's use that to measure how valuable the planning is, right? How valuable it is to engage in that extra thinking for this particular state of the, the chess game. And so we can contrast what's called the, the depth one move, right? Which is where we're not engaging in planning. We're just sort of looking at the quality of the board positions versus the depth 15 move where we're planning 15 moves out into the future. And we can quantify the, the difference between the quality of the moves that we get in terms of the way we measure this is, this is the probability that you win the game from this position as predicted by the chess engine. Um, uh, and with no information about time. So it just says, how good is this board position in terms of my estimate of the chance that you win the game if you're in this particular position? And so 
For some board positions like this one, there's a big difference between not planning and planning 15 steps into the future. So this is a situation where if you didn't plan, you would use your queen to take this pawn. You get a pawn for that, so it's worthwhile. Uh, but the problem is that you miss the fact that this rook can come over and put you in check, and then you take that, and then this queen comes over, and then you're in check again, and suddenly, like seven moves in the future, you're in checkmate, right? And so this is a situation where planning is really valuable. This is a situation where planning is not. It doesn't matter whether you think 15 steps into the future or not, you make the same move. Your rook here takes this uh, knight, and um, that's that move is the same. And so here, the, the value of planning is essentially zero. And so we can calculate that. Uh, what we call the um, the value of computation for different board states in the database that we have. And then we can compare that to how much time people actually spent thinking in those states. And this is what that looks like. And so you can see now we have a very nice positive relationship. These little numbers correspond to different conditions for time conditions for playing chess. So this is a 60 second uh, per player game uh, with no extra time added after every move. This is 1800 seconds and 20 extra seconds added after every move. But you can see across all of these different time conditions, we see this nice positive relationship, meaning that people are actually sensitive to this and they are spending more time thinking about what move they're going to make in states where it's actually more valuable to engage in that kind of computation. And I'm not going to show you the results for this, but we actually break this down by skill levels as well. And the effect increases as people get better at chess. So it seems like it's partly a learned ability to make this discrimination of how valuable it is to think in that particular state. Now, one thing you might notice here is there's a kind of nonlinearity. Why is there a nonlinearity? It's kind of weird. Maybe we would expect this to be more like a linear relationship. Um, the nonlinearity comes from the, the specific uh, structure of cost in the context of chess, right? In all of the other examples I presented, cost was very sort of simply characterized. But here we have a nice case where we have tons of data and we can actually dig into what cost looks like. And the way that it manifests is basically that um, you can think about chess as a situation where you don't just care about board position and then some sort of linearly increasing cost, you care about board position relative to how much time you have left. And so what this shows, this is this is all data. It's kind of like, you know, it doesn't look like data because it's so there's so much data went into making this, but this is doing that dimensionality reduction and now plotting, this is time remaining in the game and this is board position <laughs> advantage as measured by the AI chess engine. And then in each of these cells, I'm showing you the probability that you actually win the game from that board position. And what you should be able to see, it's easiest to see here because this is sort of most compressed in time, is that your board position, like having a, a, a strong board position advantage really matters as you're getting towards the end of the game, right? And so there's this change in how valuable just sort of generic board position is where it only really matters if it gets you to one of these very good board positions as you run out of time. And so we can actually think about this in terms of the optimal strategy. And here the optimal strategy is now you should only think an amount that consumes a certain amount of time if it gives you at least this many units of improvement in board position. And we can trace out those sort of ISO contours of, uh, you know, of winning probability. And those ISO contours give us this nonlinearity. So that nonlinearity is just a consequence of the, the time structure of chess, meaning that you, you don't care linearly about cost. You care about cost in this way that's sort of very intimately dependent on the structure of the game. Okay, I'm going to wrap up. So implications here. So first of all, Resource rationality gives us perhaps a better normative criterion for evaluating human behavior. Oh, yeah. Question about the chess data. Yeah. Um, do you have data about expertise? Uh, yeah, yeah. So we have, yeah. Does it matter? Yeah, so they get they get better at doing this as they get okay. more expert, yeah. Um, uh, resource rationality gives us a, a better normative criterion for evaluating human behavior, right? So I sort of showed you this picture before. We can actually say precisely how much better people could be doing, right? Um, and it's not just, hey, you're doing it wrong. It's like, you're doing it wrong in this particular way, and we can break that down. Um, it also gives us perhaps a different way of addressing deviations from that normative standard. So I'm not going to have time to talk about this, but one of the things that we've been doing is actually uh, formalizing the idea of nudging, right? Where you can think about if you've got this meta-level model, we can make predictions about how changing your decision environment is going to change the strategy you're going to use. And we can try and design decision environments that are going to lead people to make better decisions with it with less computational cost. Uh, and we've done this in the context of Mouse Lab, and it, it, it helps and makes people make better decisions. Um, and third of all, I think importantly, by putting the emphasis back on cognitive processes, right, and not having this kind of behaviorist characterization of rationality, it gives us tools that we can use for answering these questions that we as cognitive scientists might care about, about what should be going on inside people's heads and, and a sort of framework for thinking about deriving those predictions about not just the external actions in the world, but also the internal cognitive processes. 
and making connections to things like Markov decision processes, as I mentioned, that have been used extensively in cognitive neuroscience. It also supports a search for mechanisms that we could think about that might underlie these kinds of processes as well. All right, thank you very much. Okay. I'm going to put the chat people up here so that they can ask questions if they want to. Okay. Uh, yeah. Um, thanks for very easy help. I'm thinking back to way back to the 90s, cognitive uh, psychology. Um, there was an idea a long time ago of cognitive signals. And to put it in a, a phrasing, um, I think you said, uh, make the right choice, make the right, do the right thinking. Mm -hmm. um, it was phrased as do the least. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering if you could comment on how this um, makes contact with that early work. Yep. Is it just that do the least thinking is just one strategy? among the um, potential options of do the right thinking? Yeah. Um, so, the, so the question for, for folks on Zoom was, how does this compare to a sort of cognitive miser approach where we're thinking about doing the least possible thinking? Um, I think that's one way of, of, of thinking about that, right? Which is that what I'm doing is explicitly formalizing this as a trade-off where it's not just minimize one variable or maximize the other variable, which I think give you those two extremes of a maximally miserly person versus the expected utility case, right? But saying, let's think about this as a trade-off and you know, then we can explore what different points on that trade-off look like in terms of the assumptions that we make about what the underlying computational costs are. And in order to be able to do that, we actually need a sophisticated formal framework, right? Because we need to be able to solve the optimization problems under different kinds of constraints. And that's kind of what I'm offering here. Fascinating. Thank you. Um, one question you may have addressed, but you didn't. Um, so you're contrasting a model based on cognitive states with one that would just sort of focus on the consequences of the people. Could those two be better? And would they make different predictions? Could you use the same machine learning? Yeah. So you just focused on sort of the real outcomes? as opposed to the posture of these cognitive states. Yeah. Those two models make different predictions. Okay, so the question is, if we, you know, how, how do we get different predictions out of models that do and don't have cognitive states in them? Yes. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I think there's a, a, like a important sense in which I think the model that doesn't have any cognitive states is sort of ill-posed, right? Mm -hmm. So I would be pretty, hesitant to say, I mean, so that, that said. How do you, in some sense, in some of these tests, uh, basically create the amount of states are linked to behaviors? Uh, like choosing the boxes. It's sort of like yeah, that's right, that's right. So we've, we've, as I said, we sort of externalized it, right? We sort of made it so that the, the task has that component now built into it in a way where we can measure it, yeah. Um, so, so you're right, so for the externalized cases, those two things, in some sense should be the same, which is part of why we then, so I showed you two cases. I showed you um, the, the, um, the, the uh, mouse lab version, right? And then I showed you the gaze version. And then I did for planning, I sort of had the mouse lab, you know, spider, right? And then I had the chess case, right? And so part of the reason why I think that's relevant is that we want to be able to, make the predictions in both of those cases, yeah. Okay, it just it allows for generalization across different tasks. Yeah, yeah. Um, so from the human, humans are embarrassing perspective or like the predictively irrational perspective, um, it's not that all humans are embarrassing <laughs> or <laughs> predictably irrational. The experts aren't going to hear, mm -hmm. right? And so going back to the question of, you know, expertise related to chess, um, I'm sort of wondering whether in those data and a lot of your other data where you're dealing with, I'm sure very smart college students, right. um, whether you're kind of oversampling from experts yeah. and, and so giving us a more optimistic perspective on this. Yeah. 
um, what does learning look like? You know, yeah. are you are people um, general generally starting with these um, optimal strategies and just fine tuning them, or is there more of a categorical shift whereby people may start as less optimal yeah. and then shift based on experts? Okay, so great question for the folks on Zoom. The question was, uh, are we just focused on experts here, and then what does learning look like when we consider these populations? So, so one nice thing about this framework is that it actually gives us a way of thinking about learning by making that connection to reinforcement learning. So in reinforcement learning, there's two general strategies people talk about for, for, for learning how to solve something like these kind of like sequential decision problems. One is called a model-based strategy. Um, and that's where effectively you kind of like learn a model of the world and then plan in that model of the world. And then the other is what's called a, a model-free strategy. And that's where you basically are just learning in this state, I perform this action, right? And you're learning the association between states and actions. And so both of those are things that we can actually do in the context of this, this task. So, um, uh, wait, let's see if I can, okay. uh, so, um, the, we've looked at both of these. So the, the model based version is basically like, if you've got a set of strategies that you could, you could be using, you can kind of build an internal model of what it would mean to, to use that strategy to solve this problem. Right. And so you figure out roughly how long it takes you to do something if you do it a particular way, roughly how likely it is to succeed, and that gives you the components you need to make that decision. Um, the model-free strategy is actually taking the meta-level market decision process, remember we're talking about those cognitive action, those computations you perform, and then learning, oh, that's an effective kind of thing to think about in this kind of circumstance. Um, and that's something where, you know, that sort of gives you a, um, uh, a way that you can actually go through and, and, and learn these kinds of things. And so we've looked at both of those, but let me show you some of the results from the, um, uh, the, the, the metacognitive reinforcement learning. So this is using our, our, our spider task. What we do is we give people feedback um, on like whether the, the metacognitive actions that they're performing make sense, right? Whether they're sort of searching too much or searching too little. Um, and they, they basically uh, get a delay, <laughs> which is defined, which is based on um, like how close they come to using the optimal strategy to make a decision in that circumstance. And that gives them a signal that they can then use for, for doing metacognitive reinforcement learning. And so what we find is that when we do that, um, people, so this is, this is um, uh, again, college students, but you know, they're sort of people in general sort of get better at performing this task as they go along. Um, but if we give them that metacognitive feedback signal, they get even better, even faster, right? Um, and and then end up producing, um, in this case, sort of optimal performance at the end of the day. And so we think about that as being a thing that's going on for all of us, which is that, you know, as you're going around and trying to solve different kinds of problems, you're getting feedback about whether the way that you're thinking about things is actually effective and that feedback you can integrate into learning. It might take a really long time, though, to figure that out because that's not explicit feedback in the way that we're perhaps used to when we're learning about the work. Okay. So, so thanks, thanks for hearing that. I think it's a really cool idea that you've taken this, this thing that could be in the physical world. I, I can't help thinking of it in optimal foraging all the time. Yeah. Say, okay, let's think about it as optimal foraging in the mind. And one of the things I'm just wondering if you can say a little more about is, you know, the optimal foraging literature was so cool and 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 uh, I loved it, but it kind of died out because I think in part it just it wasn't clear what the constraints are supposed to mm -hmm. be that, that that are limiting optimality. So you yeah. see some cases where animal is pretty optimal, but they said, okay, well, there's these things like how many how many things can you remember? How long can you remember? Right. How well are you estimating time? How well are you estimating yeah. your entry? Mm -hmm. And I, I was waiting for you to about those things and I feel like we, we've taken that same limitation and then yeah. we're seeing it again that, that you didn't talk about how many possibilities can a person entertain those mm -hmm. and how well can they remember those I wonder if you just say yeah. about it. Okay, so the question was, um, it, it, it seems like, I mean, I'm, I'm gonna re rephrase, right? It's like, it, it, it seems like there's a lot of knobs that we have to set <laughs> in order to use this about what the costs are and what the actions are and so on. Um, and so I think wanting to see more of that, right? Um, and so, uh, I mean, the way that I'd answer that is yes, um, but I think what I see as the value of this is that it gives you then a setup that you can use to start to explore, you know, those those different settings, right? So, um, 
in all of the models that I presented, we made very simplistic assumptions about cost. And part of the reason for that is that I wanted to show you how far you can get when you make simplistic assumptions. Um, but uh, it then gives you a lens that you can use for then digging in and saying, can we actually more precisely estimate what cost looks like in this kind of setting? Um, uh, so the, the case where I talked about like the most complex characterization of cost. And again, this isn't, this still isn't like metabolic cost or whatever it is that's going on inside people's bodies when they're playing chess, but it's still in the context of the game that they're playing was this one. And I think scenarios like this are actually really useful because they allow us to have enough data to get us beyond the simple assumptions. And so a lot of what we're, we're, we're actually using this case and starting to dig in deeper and see if we can actually get some more insight into things like one of the big questions that I didn't answer here is, how the heck are people even knowing what the value of computation is, right? Like how, how do you figure out that you should think in this chess position without thinking? <laughs> um, uh, and so we have another model which actually estimates that. It's a, like looks at a chess position and then produces an estimate of, um, of this quantity. But, but those are the kinds of things where, you know, in at least the cases where we have a lot more data, we can start to dig in and, and make some of those more fine-grained kinds of decisions. And I think that's a, that's a thing that might be different from the animal case to some extent is that we really can get massive amounts of data in some of these settings that um, might allow us to get that kind of resolution. Yeah, I think we might still be a little stuck though is the constraints, right? Yeah. It's, it's the constraints on the system that, that really uh, dictate what what can be optimal because yeah. if you, if you, you know, the computer can consider 100,000 options, the person right. can only consider one. Yeah. Well, that's, that's, that's a constraint. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Uh, yeah, great talk. Thanks. Um, so it strikes me that the, the hard problem of our AI research is really building specific AI like chess systems to the like, general, 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 general problem solvers. And, and part of that problem has to do with the difference of utility functions as well. So they just figure they like that utility functions to really define um, and in most of the example we gave, it, it was as well. So the general purpose problem solver, solver has to not only make decisions in the case of an unknown utility function, but also choose which utility function to try to optimize. And that, those, and, and defining those utility maximization decision making processes is okay, something that AI research is attempting to get failed to do. Mm -hmm. So, do your results speak to the path toward, I guess, building general AI? And, and if so, how? And if not, I guess, why not? Um, okay. <laughs> All right. So, the, so the question was, um, uh, like, it seemed, like, it seems like some of the this is this is a fun exercise, right? You get to see me like trying to reframe my <laughs> question. Uh, um, it seems like part of what makes it hard to make general artificial intelligence is defining the utility functions that we should actually be using, right? And does this shed shed light on that, right? Um, I would say the answer is no, right? <laughs> so. Um, uh, we have some other work where we look at um, we look at this kind of problem. It's, it's called um, a uh, um, an optimal reward design problem, right? So optimal reward design is where you know, let's say you're going to build a robot. Um, you know what learning algorithm that robot is going to use. Right. It's going to use in a reinforcement learning setting, something like Q learning, right? So you say, I've got a robot. It's going to use this particular learning algorithm. Here's the reward function. Here's, here's the function that I care about it optimizing, right? I'm going to write down the thing that I want the robot to ultimately do. But then that might not be the best function to give to the robot because uh, it might be really hard to learn. That might be a very sparse signal or something like that. And so I'm actually going to give the robot a different reward function and I can then optimize over the space of reward functions for what we're going to give the robot in order to allow the robot using the learning algorithm it's using to learn to optimize the function that I is the thing that I actually care about, right? So you treat the reward function as a free parameter, as a sort of parameterized function that we're going to actually optimize in order to get the robot to do the thing that you want it to do. Um, so we have some work where we use that to explain human happiness, <laughs> right? Where the idea is that that internal sense of happiness you have is an optimized reward function, which has been optimized by something like evolution, right? In order to get evolution to do the things that evolution wants you to do. <laughs> um, uh, and that gives you a way of sort of like understanding some of the characteristics of the, the human 
the reward functions that seem to motivate humans, right? So including things like comparison um, and regret are things that when we when we look at this empirically, actually improve the performance of reinforcement learning agents. Um, and so I think you could start to engage with things like that and sort of think about, you know, um, you know, if we want to try and reverse engineer what human utility functions look like, maybe there's frameworks you can use for doing that. What I would say is the 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 main insight that comes from this that's relevant to AGI is that the the current paradigm in AI does not look like the the sort of the human case, right? So if you think about humans, we have limited amounts of data, you know, in the worst case, because we die, right? Like when we look at like, uh, you know, not not necessarily deep blue, but if we look at like alpha, alpha go, uh, that learns from many human lifetimes of data, right? Whereas we're restricted to just one. Um, uh, we have limited computational resources in the sense that I was talking about. We have limited communication, right? And that we're not able to sort of just, you know, simply parallelize and share data with one another by transferring that from one mind to another or share sort of computation by pooling our computational resources directly in the way that machines can. So machines are not subject to, to any of the kinds of, you know, constraints that, that humans are, are subject to. Um, and the current sort of paradigm in AI is one of just like, like turning up that knob of data and computation as far as you can turn it in order to get as much out of scalable, flexible learning algorithms that are able to exploit that, right? And so I would say, I don't think that means that you should necessarily do anything different in AI, right? It's gonna, that seems to be working fine for producing certain kinds of AI systems. But if you wanted to produce systems that are like people, then the constraints actually matter, right? What makes humans have the flavor of intelligence that we have as humans is those constraints. It's that we need to be able to efficiently use the limited resources. We need to be able to use the amounts of data that we have. And so if your definition of AGI is like, you know, something like people, then I think focusing on paradigms that are more constrained is actually something that's going to drive us to think about things like inductive bias and meta reasoning and these other components that are actually important to characterize into the definition. Yeah. Um, there's one in the chat. Oh. Okay. So in the types of models you've shown in which you impose costs, conditions, rewards, is it inevitable you obtain the kinds of curves you've shown, initially increasing and decelerating and asymptoting? If so, do these classes of models only differ in the values of linear and nonlinear parameters? And if so, how differentiable are different models from each other, even in large samples? Okay. Um, so... I think you should be able to differentiate different kinds of costs. I think the chess case is a nice illustration of this. So when we went into this, we weren't expecting to see this kind of nonlinearity and it falls out of this kind of nonlinearity that's intrinsic to chess. Uh, and if you didn't have um, this kind of structure, then you would get out a very different sort of looking optimal strategy, right? So this, this optimal strategy is very much determined by the shape of the, uh, the, the particular sort of relationship between time and, and board position that you see in the game of chess. Um, uh, and we, we're actually currently doing some analyses of Go, which has a different reward structure. It seems like we get something similar, but that's still TBD. There's some uh, some issues with the way that the, 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 the um, uh, AI agents work for Go. But I think, I think with large data sets, it should be possible to, um, to differentiate some of those things. All right, great, thanks. Uh, very cool work. Um, I'm going to ask a slightly speculative question. We started touching on it, I think, in the last two answers ago, but I, it really feels like your work is starting to touch on this idea of, like, okay, so like a human can play chess on a cup of coffee and piece of toast, but a computer requires a whole power plant. And I'm curious if anyone in the lab is working on, or if you can just talk about some work that you do. Um, training computers to solve the sort of naturalistic problems with far fewer power from this current footprint than what they currently needs to be slightly more of the humans and the efficiency that. Yeah. Um, we at the moment are not doing that. And just just to sort of explain the sort of context of that. So um, at the moment, what we've been focused on is just characterizing what those optimal efficient strategies look like. 
Right? One problem with that is that actually computing those optimal efficient strategies takes <laughs> more computation right, than uh, in some of these cases of solving the problem straightforwardly. Right? So, so that's useful to us as cognitive scientists for knowing what those optimal strategies are and being able to compare them to people and sort of get insights in that way. But it's not a practical method that you can use for solving these problems. Um, that said, uh, I think that kind of theoretical framework gives you a way of at least thinking about what the objective would be for building those kinds of efficient systems. There's a little bit of work in deep learning where people have started to think about some of these things. So um, adaptive computation networks and um, PonderNet are two examples of systems that try and sort of like make decisions about, in those cases, there are current neural networks that make decisions about like how many steps of processing you do before you sort of you know pass on the data. Um, uh, and, um, uh, but but that work has been done kind of in isolation from any any of the theoretical literature on on meta reasoning. So I think there's lots of opportunities to be doing smarter stuff in that space. Hey, so really cool talk. Thank you for sharing this. So um, I wanted to ask if any of the work you're doing, specifically something like the chess example, is looking at one decision maker over time. Because when I think about this, especially with you know with me thinking about humans being fallible decision makers, yeah. I think about you know you can make optimal decisions some of the time. Everyone can make optimal decisions and choose optimal strategies some of the time, but over time we tend not to be good. Yeah. And a consensus of humans does way better than a single human, mm -hmm. as is the case for animals. And so, have you uh, wanted to before about looking about how those strays from optimality happen within a single decision making? agent um human in this case in a way that a model wouldn't really be doing or if these models mean? uh so sorry so the says so the question i thought i thought you were getting at how does it change over yeah experience. So okay. it changes over time okay. so okay. to me it strikes me as like even if yep. i'm really good at chess right. for example right. i'm not going to continue making the yep. optimal strategy over yep. time we will stray from it in predictable yep. and maybe interesting ways okay so the question is can we have we looked at uh, how within humans we see changes in their strategies over time and 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 sort of variation in the extent to which they're doing something that seems optimal or reasonable? Um, so in this paper um, uh, on model based rational meta reasoning, um, uh, which is um, uh, it's, it's called uh, strategy selection as rational meta-reasoning. Um, we look at this developmentally, right? So there's a lot of developmental data on strategy choice. Um, and uh, that's actually then interesting to think about, like, um, you know, when you if, you, if you look at kids, for example, learning arithmetic, right? They start out with certain kinds of strategies and they develop more sophisticated strategies over time. And so, so that's something that you can look at and we look at in terms of like just sort of like building better models of what kinds of strategies you should use in what situations and that resulting in then getting a much more fine-grained sort of picture of like what they should be doing under certain circumstances. Yeah. Um, I think also from that perspective, one thing I think that's nice about this framework, at least as compared to a sort of classical rationality, is that exactly that it allows you to answer that kind of question where you can say, you know, if there's a maturational component or something like that, which changes what computations are accessible to you or what the costs are that are associated with them, that gives you an account of how it is that you expect the strategies that somebody would use would change. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much.